Okay, are we filming here? Uh, we're filming here. <laughs> <laughs> We are starting. This is Hawk Podcast number nine. I'm David Liggett with Data Center Hawk, and uh, very excited to get to share uh, the content of this podcast. If you're interested, wherever you are joining us from in the internet universe, uh, we want to let you know that we have content in multiple places. Like you can run, but you can't hide. We will find you. Uh, so we. You know, we post all of our, our, our podcast content on SoundCloud, iTunes, and one more, Rhett. Oh, yeah, Spotify. Hello. Uh, those three, and that's where you can get any of our podcast content. And if you actually want to see some of the videos that we make and things like that, you can get them on YouTube, uh, Instagram, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn. So all those places, that is where we are. Uh, also, something that helps us if you do enjoy our podcast and uh, the data center industry insights that we are providing consistently, we would ask you to share those with your uh, friends, business colleagues. Uh, it always helps us and we love getting the message out. So if you get a chance, share. That would be awesome. Uh, and today on Hawk Podcast number nine, I am excited because we are talking about all things Seattle. That's right. We're talking about the Seattle data center market today, which is really fun. Uh, it's a really interesting market, and the growth there has been um, interesting to watch over the last several years, and we'll get into that here in a moment. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is uh, another segment that we feature on our podcast, which is called Ask DCH, which stands for Data Center Hawk. Uh, and we're going to cover a question today that handles what type of physical security measures do data center operators take to protect their customers? So we will uh, be handling that as well. Uh, so first we're going to talk about, as I mentioned before, the Seattle data center market. And I want to cover a couple things with that market specifically, uh, three things. The first one is why Seattle is an attractive uh, place for data center users. Why are data center users going to Seattle? Why do they find the market uh, acceptable for their uh, IT infrastructure? So that's the first thing I want to talk about. Uh, number two, where does Seattle data center market growth occur? It's always interesting when you look at uh, the footprint of a data center market and how historically uh, the, the data center development has taken place, where it has gone, why it has gone to those specific places. So we're going to talk about that as the second topic. And then uh, the third thing we will discuss is the Seattle data center market moving forward. So a couple of thoughts that we have about uh, what the opportunities are there, some of the challenges for that market as well. Um, so a quick overview of the Seattle market as a whole. Um, you know, Seattle is what we would consider a data center hawk, really a, a secondary market. And I just mean that really by the amount of, of commission multi-tenant data center power that's in that market. You know, we size data center markets uh, on a quarterly basis and, and pay attention to things like vacancy rates. If you're in the commercial real estate industry, uh, you know, you, you recognize the value of understanding how vacancy changes and, and how much available capacity has been delivered to a market, uh, what the absorption is, how much is under construction, how much is planned down the road. So we deliver a lot of that data. And one of the things we found about Seattle is it's 95, uh, approximately 95 megawatts of multi-tenant uh, data center commission power. And so that's a really important fact. And it kind of puts it into the uh, 10th, 11th, 12th uh, data center market from a size perspective. Uh, and again, that's multi-tenant data center uh, you know, commission power. Uh, and and really what we've seen is that market has been attractive to data center users for a number of reasons. And I wanted to walk through a couple of those. Uh, you know, one is for the most part the, the business climate in Seattle is favorable. And, you know, it, it's interesting because like giants, you know, companies like Microsoft, Amazon, you know, both have headquarters in Seattle, which has driven an increased presence of technology companies and jobs in the city. So when you just think about the city as a whole, uh, there's obviously an active uh, presence from these big, large technology companies. Boeing has a huge presence 
in that market. They're headquartered there, obviously. Seattle ranks second in the nation uh, in concentration for software programmers and engineers uh, and third overall in the nation for, for ICT industry jobs, and that's according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, so I think that just shows you that there is a very active job market uh, in Seattle. It's also home to Fortune 500 companies such as Starbucks, one that I spend uh, entirely too much money at consistently, uh, Nordstrom, Costco. We mentioned Boeing. So these are also companies that have uh, their, their headquarters there and have grown there for a long time. Uh, and, and, you know, typically these companies are heavily invested in the market and will expand in the market from a job perspective. They obviously have a presence all across the world. But this is where uh, they call home. And because of the major companies and tech talent in Seattle, uh, you know, the market's well positioned to accommodate continued data center growth by end users and data center operators as well. You know, one of the uh, important things to note, just because a company has a large headquarters somewhere does not necessarily mean they have a large data center presence there. Obviously, companies like these uh, will have some sort of uh, data center presence in the market that they are headquartered in, but they also their their data center presence reaches far beyond this location. But but one of the reasons that uh, the data center market has done well there is there is uh, uh, in market demand from companies that are growing. And we see that not just in Seattle, but also in other data center markets as well. You know, you have companies that are looking uh, across the U.S. If we're just thinking about the U.S. or North America at different markets that might fit the profile they need to place a data center uh, a location in a certain market. Uh, and, and, but there's also the companies that are, that are headquartered in that market that have some sort of requirement and they choose to be there versus uh, somewhere else. Uh, another really good example about uh, Seattle, you know, just last week, uh, Salesforce announced that they acquired Tableau uh, and they're headquartered in Seattle. I think the the price was around sixteen billion dollars, uh, and that's just another example of a, of a s smaller company that's obviously grown quite a bit, um, and will continue to grow in that market. So, you know, the business climate in Seattle, given the the uh, sizes of some of the companies there, as well as the Fortune five hundred companies, it's just a very favorable market. That's one of the reasons that the data center market uh, is strong there. Uh, you know, another reason that the Seattle market is attractive to data center users is because of the strategic location uh, in the Pacific Northwest. And, and the other thing is it, it benefits because it's easily accessible to other larger markets throughout the U.S. So as an example, the close proximity to Silicon Valley in L.A. allows for an easy interconnection to those cities. Uh, there's a direct connection to the growing Portland and Hillsborough market. Uh, Seattle acts as a fiber and connectivity gateway to international markets as well. So with access to Canada through Vancouver uh, and Asia through some of the Trans-Pacific cables running directly from Seattle. So uh, the, the location is strategic, and it's another reason that uh, different companies will look at Seattle as a potential data center uh, location. Uh, it's also actually, and this is a side note, uh, you don't have to pay for this. Um, uh, but this is, uh, you know, one of the things that is interesting, uh, at least on the West coast over the last, I don't know, two to three years has been as costs in California have increased and some of the, you know, secondary West coast cities, Phoenix, Vegas, Reno, Portland, Seattle, uh, Quincy, those type of markets have gotten more mature there's a really interesting competitive game going on between each one of these markets and different requirements that are in these markets. So one of the things that's interesting about the data center space is that uh, data center operators traditionally will compete uh, in uh, compete for opportunities, and those opportunities might be looking at multiple locations. And so, you know, just traditionally, if you're if you're competing on a, a, a more of like a commercial real estate transaction. Most of those are done at the city level. The data center transactions, as they as this business becomes more global, are being done at the market level, which is an interesting thing to consider. Um, and then the third thing I just wanted to talk about with the Seattle market and why data center users find it attractive are for, uh, because of the reasonable economic costs. 
And, you know, I, I highlight that. Uh, and again, not to hate on California because both California data center markets are um, extremely strong uh, and, and growing. But there's a there's a considerable cost difference between, you know, those markets and then the others that are on the West Coast and then, you know, kind of in the Southwest uh, of, of the um, United States. But the Seattle area, there's operational cost operational advantages when compared to those other markets. Uh, you know, just from a power cost perspective, we've talked about this before, but power cost is a significant cost to any data center user uh, with a significant footprint. And so that is something that uh, you can, that, that Seattle will benefit from. And again, it's not, the, it's not the most inexpensive place for power. Typically, we've seen companies that have very large deployments looking for cheap power go to areas like Quincy uh, and some, you know, other places like that where there's, you know, costs of power that are below like three cents a kilowatt hour. Um, but if you think about housing your IT infrastructure in a city that has reasonable costs, uh, certainly Seattle is one of them. Um, and it also has, you know, very competitive co-location market. So whether you have a smaller one to 20 cabinet deployment or you have a, a 500 KW requirement. Um, you know, there are data center operators that will be very competitive on uh, where those market rates are. So th those are some of the reasons that we've seen the Seattle data center market grow, the favorable business climate, the strategic location, and the reasonable economic costs. And, you know, if you put mature data center operators in a market like that, uh, traditionally, you will see growth or we've seen growth across the U.S., uh, so that was the first thing I wanted to cover is why Seattle is an attractive market for data center users. Uh, the second thing I wanted to cover was where does Seattle data center development occur? Because that's a very interesting thing to consider when you're looking at different geographies across uh, the world and how those markets traditionally are, are growing. Um, so, you know, data centers in Seattle are really clustered into two, two regions. Um, the downtown urban core, which is where you'll find uh, the Carrier Hotel and some other, uh, I would say, uh, retrofit facilities that are now being positioned to handle uh, growth that is tied to connectivity. Uh, and then, so that's one area is that downtown urban core. And then I would say mostly industrial area south of downtown near the Boeing airfield and uh, the SeaTac SeaTac airport. So those are really the two places that we've seen data center market growth. When you think about the city, really everything is anchored by the Westin facility. So that's 2001 Sixth Avenue, and that is you know what most in the data center industry would consider the Carrier Hotel, the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and it's a really interesting story about that building, but it was basically built in, you know, the early 80s as a traditional high rise office facility. And a lot of I think it's important to note, if you think about carrier hotel, we should do a podcast on carrier hotels. Sure. OK, that's what, podcast number 10 carrier hotels. There we go. But uh, but, you know, the the most of the carrier hotels in, you know, all these different markets were, you know, basically office buildings that were converted because of their proximity to, you know, the, the power and the, the connectivity. And they were just at areas of tremendous uh, connectivity infrastructure. And that really allowed for a, a lot of the interconnection opportunities that are in these buildings to be uh, what they are today. But basically that building was built in the early eighties, got significant interest from the telecom industry. And as you've seen the telecom industry change and mature, as you've seen the data center industry change and mature, uh, and interconnection has become much more important. Uh, that building is one that really serves the needs. I think today there's over 200 service providers in the building continuing to grow. And then, as I mentioned before, there's a number of other facilities downtown that are highly connected as well that are serving the needs of, of interconnection uh, users uh, in that market. So, and, and again, that's a trend we see in other markets as well. But that is what you see downtown. That is where you've got a core of, of data centers there. Uh, and then there's a, a number of other facilities from a development perspective that have moved to the southern part of the city in areas like Tequila, 
uh, and this is where the main data center campus of, of, of Sabi data centers resides. They're one of the larger wholesale uh, co-location data center operators in that market. Uh, and actually on that campus, there's a number of retail data center operators that uh, have a location. There's a couple of others that are either that are, that are even further south of that. But that is that's really where you've seen development, um, you know, from companies like, as I mentioned, uh, Sabi. Uh, Digital Realty has a presence there in in Seattle, uh, Co-Location Northwest, Sextera, uh, Equinix, um, Evoke, GI Partners, uh, H5 Data Centers in the downtown area, INAP in the downtown area, Lincoln Rackhouse has recently entered the market with a purchase of a data center operator there, Tierpoint, uh, Zcolo, all those companies have a have a significant offering in the Seattle market, and that's one of the reasons these data center markets continue to grow is that companies like those are investing uh, both in the infrastructure uh, as well as the products that they're offering in those markets. Uh, the, the other thing I would just mention is you know the region's connectivity. It's 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 really international when you think about it. And and uh, as I mentioned before, with the, the carrier hotels, the Internet exchange is benefiting from the proximity to the to Canadian border uh, border and the termination points for some of the undersea cables linking Asia to America. Uh, but it really sets it up to receive, you know, the IP, IP traffic coming from the economic hubs of places like Vancouver, Beijing, Seoul, Tokyo. Um, and, and so that's, that's where we've seen the, the growth take place and the connectivity take place. Uh, and the types of companies that traditionally are looking for and growing in the Seattle market are companies that are in industries like the aerospace, uh, financial, healthcare, technology, transportation industries. Those are the type of companies that we're seeing continue to grow uh, in that market. Uh, so we've talked about why Seattle is an attractive data center market for, for end users. We've discussed uh, where uh, the Seattle development occurs. And I want to talk about two things related to the Seattle data center market moving forward. Um, and one is, you know, from my from our perspective at Data Center Hawk, you know, we think that the market's going to continue to attract companies that are growing in that specific market with IT infrastructure demand. Uh, you know, I think the good news for Seattle is some of the world's largest cloud service providers are there. Uh, as well as the number of Fortune 500 companies that we mentioned before. There's all, also, uh, Seattle has a significant startup community as well. Uh, and it's, you know, as I mentioned, in the, in the area where you have some, some very large companies. So I think that's a, a big opportunity for the Seattle market as it relates to, to co-location transactions. You know, the, the market is not one that does huge, uh, uh, big data center transactions like we've seen in other areas like a Northern Virginia or a Phoenix or Chicago, but they certainly uh, attract, you know, companies with sizable IT infrastructure demand. And I think that will continue. Uh, you know, the other thing that I think Seattle will have to, you know, figure out moving forward is how do you compete with those markets in close proximity that are very competitive, uh, like a Hillsboro, like a Quincy, uh, like a Vegas, and and that will be something that th that you'll see with all those markets will be opportunities that are uh, really evaluating one versus the other and trying to figure out from a cost perspective, from a physical location perspective, uh, from a tax incentive standpoint, uh, from a connectivity side of things, what makes the most sense for that requirement. And so, you know, we've said this before, the cheapest option is not always the best option. I mean, that's that that's just a general life. See, you get life lessons here. That's just a general life lesson, but it also holds true for data center infrastructure as well. I mean, you get, I won't say you get what you pay for, but, you know, there's a reason that, um, you know, certain companies will offer things very cheap. And so, uh, again, our, our uh, counsel to data center users in the space has always been, hey, uh, economics is a very big part of the discussion, but it's not the only part. Uh, and so, uh, but but I think the market is getting more aggressive and will be in the next 12 to 18 months as it relates to deals looking in those specific markets. 
Um, so that is Seattle. It's a really interesting data center market. Um, and again, we covered why Seattle is an attractive uh, data center market for companies today where the growth is occurring, both downtown and in the southern area of the city. Uh, and then also uh, we talked about some of the things that will happen in the, in the Seattle data center market moving forward. Uh, so if you're interested in more about the Seattle data center market, and like deeper information, deeper uh, data, et cetera. You, you can get that on our site, just datacenterhawk.com uh, and, and go to our insight tool. And there's, there's plenty of, of data uh, in that area. Uh, so now I want to move on to a part of our podcast called Ask DCH, which is where we get you to ask questions and then we answer them. Uh, and so this is the second time we've done this. And the Ask DCH question for today is, what type of physical security measures do data center operators take to protect their customers? Um, and so it's a great question. Uh, you know, if you've been in the industry, you're aware of some of these. Uh, if you've not been in the industry or are new to the space, uh, I would say a significant amount of thought and time goes into physically protecting the customer environment uh, and the customer data, obviously, at a, at a data center facility. So there's a couple of things that I'm going to mention here that are pretty consistent among most data center facility, facilities today, certainly the purpose-built facilities that are coming out of the ground. You know, the, the industry, and I'll do a quick tangent, but the industry for a period of time uh, was, you know, buying uh, traditional office facilities and, actually retrofitting them to be data center facilities. And so because of that, at times, it, it limited some of the physical security measures that's, that data center operators could take. And it's probably specifically around like the perimeter fencing, but everything else, you know, uh, is complete within a data center facility. But, um, but now those that are being purpose built, they're traditionally being purpose built in areas that have greater setbacks and you're able to do some things from a, I would say a, a more macro perspective to, to build into this, uh, these physical security measures. So, you know, the first thing you're going to see when you drive up on a data center campus traditionally is a, is a perimeter fence. Uh, these are uh, com uh, completed at different levels of security, but, uh, you know, you'll have to enter through a security gate. So that's really the second level of security. Uh, there's traditionally a security uh, guard at that, at that security gate that's going to let you know, someone in or out of the facility. Uh, the fourth is the security guard actually at the building. So, you know, you're basically going to have to go through some sort of, of card key access or check-in before you can actually enter the building, which a security guard lets you in. And then there's a check-in process where you provide your government issue ID. They make sure you, you are who you say you are. Uh, you know, the fifth is really card key access into the facility as a whole. So this allows you into the, the greater common area. Data centers have, have data halls, which are traditionally anywhere from 10 to, you know, 60,000 feet of raised floor or data center space. Uh, and so that, that once you, you leave the kind of uh, common area, then you get into the hallways where the data center uh, data halls are. And then you know, from there you have either card key access, biometric access, retinal scanner access, actually into a data hall. And that's a, another level, that's a sixth level. And then there's, if you're going into a cage itself or an area, specific area where uh, a data center environment is, an IT infrastructure environment, there's security access into that. So it could be the same thing, card key, biometric, something to do with, you know, uh, some sort of scan et cetera, and that gets you into the actual data center space where the servers are. And then actually companies from there will take additional security measures uh, to uh, make sure that their IT infrastructure environment is secure just based on different types of compliances uh, or different types of internal company standards that they've set to make sure that the actual physical uh, security is in place. And that they're okay. So that's traditionally what you will see, but it's a great question. What type of physical security measures do data center operators take to protect their customers? Uh, the answer is many. <laughs> that's, a, that's a few of them uh, right there. So uh, thanks for joining us on the podcast today. Again, we talked about the Seattle market. 
Uh, we hit an Ask DCH question. If you have additional questions, we'd love to hear about them. You can uh, send them to us through social media, and we will make sure that we answer them on our podcast. If you're interested in other Data Center Hawk content, you can find it uh, at pretty much any social channel that's out there. And uh, we're thankful that you listen and look forward to catching you on the next one. Thanks. Thanks.